ti. So good to see you this morning. Thank you very much for making the decision to be a part of our assembly, part of our final Sunday morning worship service of the year 2014. Wow, time has really flown. I appreciate the remarks of one of our shepherds as we began our assembly this morning, Brother Mike McMacken, talking about what our year has been like. And there's been a lot of good in this year. There's been a lot that hasn't been as good. The devil has has hit us a time or two and stung us, but thankfully our Lord continues to bless us and strengthen us and help us to be even wiser and stronger than we have been as we move forward. I want to ask you if you could to help out with a little project I'm going to be involved in in the next few days. As you know, since this is the last Sunday of 2014, then the next Sunday will be the first Sunday of 2015 and I'm going to try as best I can to contact every member of this church every family and just encourage us to all be here if possible Lord willing health providing and all of that creeks don't rise and and if you know of somebody that maybe you haven't seen much of lately if you would reach out to them and and love them and and ask them to be with us on this very first Sunday of 2015. We can just send the devil a little bit of a message. You know, he needs a beating. And let's give him another one this coming Sunday. And, and let's just let the community know that we're here. That we're thriving. That our best days are yet to come. And, and if you could encourage others to come. Maybe you've got some relatives that didn't come today. Had things going on. Maybe if you would reach out to them in a very creative and compassionate way and, and strongly encourage them, maybe, maybe buy them lunch next Sunday after, after Bible class or prepare a great meal for them. And let's, let's just start the year together, right? On the same page, same direction, got the same name, Christian, same eternal destiny, heaven, cleansed by the same blood, the blood of Christ. So let, let's be together. Let's try to value these forever family reunions as, as best we can and i know some people that never miss they never miss sunday morning sunday night wednesday night and, and and it'd be great if all of us could could get our names on that list of people and let's let's make that one of our priorities moving forward but help out the coming days and and, and let's be let's be making sure that every member of this church every future member of this church knows of their value to us their value to god how we want them to to be with us. I, I look back over to my left and I see Brother Walker Kirkland here, and that's always a good day. Are you still awake, Brother Walker? He's still awake. He's still awake. Brother, thinking about people that I just enjoy worshiping with. Brother Walker, if you're a visitor here, he's 110 years old, uh, thereabouts. And I, I remember seeing him. He had a had a challenging year, had some operations and some setbacks, and he had a had an event that really got him pretty sick, and, and I found out that he was in the in the emergency room over at Keller, and then they moved him into into that ICU unit, and I go over there, don't know what to expect. I'm thinking, well, this might be the last time I see Brother Walker, last time to pray with him, and, it, you know, I'm going in kind of somber and all that, and he's sitting there, got a big smile on his face, and he was telling me he had had this fall, maybe like, a, it was almost like a stroke kind of thing happened, and it caused him to fall, and and lose consciousness he came to and he, I, this 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 happened i said i said what what did you see what did you think about and he said he said well i saw your tie that you had on last sunday and it, he had joked with me before about how ugly that tie was and so he was when, when he passed out he woke up and had a vision of my ugly tie so i just get to worship with great people like brother walker i put a value to it i really do and I hope you do. I, I see this as a foretaste of heaven, except we won't have preaching. I, I kinda, I'm kind of disappointed about that. I know you're thrilled, but uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to heaven. I appreciate Mike and his remarks kind of directing us to think about those precious, for, those are the real forever family reunions we have looked for. Can't you think right now of somebody that you really miss, that you're anxious to see again, hug again, and enjoy creation and eternity with and and i've got some folks i'm looking forward to being with and i'm looking forward to being with a lot of you uh next sunday is tonight uh tuesday evening this week and then after after this week we'll go back to our wednesday midweek assembly schedule but again thank you thank you thank you for being here i want you to 
Notice with me on this final Sunday of 2014, a message from God that comes to us from the final chapter in our Bibles. Now, I want to ask you to do something that will require some discipline on your part. I want you to, to stay mentally engaged as we read from this Revelation chapter 22. I mean, you got to figure this is really important because this is our last word from God. This is our last inspired word from God. And there are some things in here. There's a message in here that is not to be missed. As we finish strong 2014, as we gear up for the best year of our lives, 2015. What's God want us to know? This is Revelation 22, beginning with verse 1. And we will read together. You'll follow along with me very keenly. Down to verse 21. And he showed me, John's writing this, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal. Won't that be beautiful? Proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And don't our nations need healing? And there shall be no more curse. Thank you, God, for that. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. <coughs> and his servants, notice this, shall serve him. They shall see his face. Think about that. And his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. You afraid of the dark? They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And I'll add the word here, amen to that. Verse 6, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent the angel to show his servants the things which must shortly come to pass, or shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly! Exclamation point. Blessed, and here comes a series of Beatitudes now. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, five times in Revelation, John claims to be the author. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, what's he doing? I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Second time he's made them this mistake in Revelation, bowing down and trying to worship an angel. Verse 9, then he said to me, see that you do not do that. Don't worship an angel, worship God. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Can I read that again? Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And hopefully we are of those who are righteous, holy, just. Verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, notice this, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. Blessed. One of these beatitudes. Blessed are those who do his commandments. That they may have the right to the tree of life. And may enter through the gates into the city. Now who's, out, who's not getting in? But outside are dogs. And sorcerers. And sexually immoral. And murderers. And idolaters. And whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Think of it this way. I am the root and the fruit of David. The bright and morning star. Notice this grand invitation. This is the last one in your Bible, verse 17. And the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, and the bride, that would be this church. And the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Hope you came thirsty today. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. Notice this warning. If anyone adds to these things, 
God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, 20 and 21, John knew how to end a letter. Last words of God now. And he who testifies to these things said, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Verse 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And the word amen means true. It means faithful. It means I believe it. God's last words to us on this last Sunday morning, on this last page of the book of Revelation, are truly a revelation to us. Consider the following revelations from this page in your Bible. Number one, Eden, as we know, was lost on the very first pages of Scripture, and now she is regained on the last page of Scripture. In a sense, long ago, paradise was lost. And now, thanks be to God, paradise has been found. In Genesis 3, 22 to 24, the tree of life was lost, cut off from man. But this tree has been restored to us, as we have just read in Revelation 22, verse 2. Also, we read in Genesis chapter 3, 14 and following, that because of the sinfulness of man and woman, there was a great curse placed upon man, mankind. The blessing from God was essentially lost for a time. But we have read this morning that because of Jesus, Revelation 22 verse 3, the gift, the blessings have been restored and the curse has been now abolished. We also have noticed this morning from our reading something that might be surprising. And this comes to us from Revelation 22, verse 3. Heaven will be a place filled of servants who are continuing to serve. Then also we notice from the Revelation this morning that we shall, think about this, from verse 4, we shall one day see the face of God. Consider that. Number 4. We note that heaven will be illuminated. It will be lit up, maybe like a Christmas tree, by our Father's light. That's verse 5 of Revelation 22. Sometimes darkness can be lonely. Sometimes darkness can be scary. Sometimes darkness can be sinister. Sometimes, sometimes darkness can be a foretaste of hell. And we know hell will be eternal darkness. Heaven will be a place of light. Because God is there, and he is that lamp. Also, you notice number five here that according to this revelation, Christ is coming quickly. That's verse 7, verse 12, verse 20 of chapter 22 here. Now some might think, quickly, how can that be? He has been gone almost now 2,000 years. But of course, according to the teaching of Peter, Second Peter Chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. A thousand years with our Lord is like a day. So in a sense, he's only been gone a couple days. He's coming back quickly, and for some more quickly than anticipated. Number six, thinking about this revelation, thinking about how we want a blessing, how we need a blessing, tells us how we can have it. Verse 7 of chapter 22, we get the blessing when we keep the words. For when we do the commandments, verse 14 of 22 tells us, we are blessed when we do God's bidding. Therefore, we are cursed when we reject His way and embrace our own. There are, by the way, seven of these blessed are yous or beatitudes found in Revelation chapter 1, 3, 14, 13, 16, 15, 19, 9, 26, and two of those we've noticed in this final chapter. God intends and desires for us to be blessed. And then number seven, you notice this, that we're going to be rewarded, maybe surprised by this, according to our work, according to what we do. Revelation 22:12 12 teaches that. Also, 2 Corinthians 5, 
Verse 10 reinforces that idea. Let me ask you to think about this. If you and I are one day going to be rewarded according to our work, and your work is different from my work, and my work is different from your work, and our works are different from each other, does that imply that we shall receive different rewards? I don't know. Just something to think about. You figure that out, let me know. Also, you notice here, number eight, Christ is to be our Alpha and our Omega. He is to be our A and our Z, our beginning and our end. He is our first breath. He is our final breath. He is our all in all. He is our bright and morning star. By the way, think about 2015. My intention is to essentially every Sunday morning of 2015 direct us as a church, as a family to Jesus. Most all the lessons are going to focus on some aspect of our Savior's life and the life He challenges each of us to live. Next Sunday, it'll be my grandest of privilege to preach Christ and Him crucified according to the teaching of 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23. Jesus, He is our essence. He is our life. It is somewhat ironic to me that that at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, he calls himself our beginning and our end. And at the end of Revelation, he also calls himself our beginning, our end, our alpha, and our omega. Who is going to be in heaven? Who gets to walk inside those beautiful gates? We're told in Revelation twenty-two fourteen, those who do his commandments. Those who do what Jesus has directed us to do. Now, you, you take verse 14 and you, you go back to Revelation 22 verse 12 where we're told we're going to be rewarded according to our work. And we're told in 14 that if we do what Jesus has told us to do, we get to go to heaven. Now that ought to, that ought to settle down some folks who are saying that because of God's amazing grace, I am not required or obligated to do anything. I still got to see that verse. Because I see this verse. I see actually these two verses. And the final page of God's final revelation to man saying that we shall be judged according to what we do. What we do and what we don't do. It matters to God. It must matter to us. Let it be our noble obsession to be about the business of doing those things that are good. To go to heaven? Yeah. But also, just because we're good people. Why does a bird sing? To be a bird? No, not necessarily. Birds sing because they are birds. And that's what birds do. Why do we do the good that we do? Because we're obligated to do this. We're commanded to do good. Because we're challenged to do good. Because we know that heaven depends on us doing good. Yeah, all that's right. But let us do good because we're good people. Because we enjoy doing good. Because that's what God expects. That's what brings us the greatest joy. Please let none of us assemble today. Because if I don't assemble, I'll go to hell. Please let us do good tomorrow, not because if I don't do good, I'll go to hell. The the quality of the good we do will suffer mightily. The, the, The quality of our worship will suffer mightily if we're doing this because we think we need to do this to avoid eternal fire. We do this because it's good for us. We do this because we want to do this. We we do this because we appreciate the blessings we have from God. But it is also the case. That each of us shall be rewarded according to what we do. Those who get into the heavenly gates, according to verse 14, are those who do the commandments. So what you're doing today is important to your eternal soul and mind. Notice number 10, who's not inside? Who doesn't get in? And I want you to notice each of the people mentioned on this list is lacking in something. They're lacking in something. You see that? These dogs that are mentioned here. Now that's not the the kind of dog that you and I raise and we have in our houses or we have in our yards. The the family pet. He's thinking here figuratively about these mongrels who were 
so vile and so vicious and they were scavengers of the of the first century they were nobody's pet they were nobody's friend he's talking about the kind of human there that lacks compassion so when you children see this passage and see that that dogs don't get into heaven don't think that that means necessarily your family i'm still holding out hope okay that some of my pets you know where i'm going with that but Don't be the kind of person who's lacking in in compassion. Don't be the kind of person that's so eager to rip and to shred other people like the vile dogs would do. Sorcerers don't get in. They're lacking authenticity. Actually, that word comes from a word that we get our word pharmacy from. These are people who were engaged in the poisoning of other people literally through drugs or through malicious and deceptive behavior. The immoral, the sexually immoral, do not get in. What are they lacking in? They're lacking in self-discipline. Murderers don't get in. What are they lacking in? They're lacking in a respect for life, human life. Also, the idolaters don't get in. And we all have a danger of being idolaters today. Especially now, we just got even more stuff to love, didn't we? Idolaters lack respect for the true God. And then those who love a lie, those who practice a lie, they don't get in. They're lacking in character. They're lacking in integrity. That's all from Revelation 22, verse 15. And because they lack these things, according to the text, they will ultimately lack eternal joy. By the way, thankfully, we can change. We, We can be this and we can become better than this. Remember 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, the terrible list, very similar to this list of people who lack certain things. And the text says, and such were some of you, but now you're washed, you're sanctified, you're cleansed. We all, in a sense, used to be on this list one way or another, but now we're on a better list. Our names are written not here, but in the Lamb's book of life. And that's a good thing for us. Notice 11, Jesus is the root and the offspring of David. He is the root and the fruit of if we, how hard is that? Think of an apple tree. You're simultaneously the root of that apple tree and you're the apple on that apple tree. That's what Jesus is. He's the beginning and the end. He was the source of David and yet he was a son of David. Pretty amazing Savior we serve. Number 12, this great invitation is to those who come thirsty, who come yearning for something better, for this water of life, Revelation 22 17 we've 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 always got to be wanting more for ourselves spiritually speaking a better relationship with god a better relationship with with his people i i I hope we desperately are thirsting to be more spiritual in 2015 than we have been in 2014 to be more righteous to be more christ-like than we've ever been in our lives Part of that journey requires us, compels us to respond to this invitation to come and drink the water freely given to us from the Lamb. Then you notice 13, this book needs no additions, no subtractions. We we weaken it by adding to it or taking from it. We weaken ourselves by doing the same. Now it's not just the book of Revelation that we're warned not to add or take from any book that comes to us from God. Deuteronomy 4, 2 Deuteronomy 12, 32, Proverbs 36, Jeremiah 26, verse 2. Just a sampling of our admonition from the Father. Accept what we've gotten from Him. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And then also we notice here number 14 from this final page. God's final words here. Do do you see that these last recorded words of man... When you compare them to the first recorded man, recorded words of man in Genesis, well, the last words recorded as spoken by man to God, they vastly are superior. They vastly trump the very first recorded words that man ever spoke to God. The first words we have recorded in Scripture of man saying something to God, that's Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. We have a very sinful man saying, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. What a pity those words are. Thankfully, the last recorded words are much superior. These are the words of a forgiven man. 
Forgiven men talk much differently than do sinful men. Revelation twenty two twenty. Even so, come, the forgiven man says, come, Lord Jesus. So we got a pity and we got a powerful plea, a wonderful prayer. And in between these two statements, the first statement in, in Scripture, basically from man to God, keep away from me, I need to run, I need to hide, I'm ashamed of myself. But the last words, I'm ready, I'm clean, I'm clear, come. And, and from those the first words to the last words throughout our Bible is woven a, a wonderful story of, of God's love for us, of God's redeeming love for us, of trying to get us from being afraid of Him to, to being welcoming of Him, to wanting to embrace Him, to wanting to be with Him forever and ever. No more shame, no more, shame, no more sin. And then the final verse, or the final passage, is a message about God's grace. Revelation 22, 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. By the way, that's the way the book also began. Chapter 1, verse 4, with a message of grace. So, now, pulling all this together, all this revelation, on the final Sunday morning, of 2014, are you, are we ready? Are we ready to enjoy a brand new Garden of Eden? Think yes. Are we ready to go where servants go? Think yes. Are we ready to see the face of God? Please be thinking yes. Are we ready to go where there will be no more darkness? Please be thinking yes. Are we ready to receive the reward for the works we have done? Please think yes. Are we ready to have our thirst quenched, satisfied forever? Think yes, please. Are we ready to enter the gates with all who have continued to do as he's commanded us to do? Think yes. Are we ready to pray that final prayer ourselves? Come, Lord Jesus, think yes, if we're ready for that. Are we ready to enjoy the blessings of everlasting grace? Please be thinking, be whispering to your spirit, yes, I am ready. The options are we're ready now. We're ready not yet. We're ready never. And sometimes not yet can become never. That's a scary thing. We're going to stand and sing a song in just a moment that I grew up singing, and maybe some of you did. It asks and answers the question, why not now? Why not come to Jesus now? It's a song, surprisingly, it's not in our psalm book, but Eli's worked hard and others have worked hard, and it's going to be up on the PowerPoint. And, and we all know the words of this song, or most all of us do. We're going to learn them together if we don't. But, but why not now? If, if we're, we're not able to, to say yes to all those questions, we're not yet ready, then why not? Now, why not get ready? Why not have Jesus as a part of our lives, the biggest, the best part of all of us? Why not today confess our belief in him? Why not today, why not now put him on in baptism for the remission of every sin we've ever committed? Why not now choose to finish this year in him, being washed of our iniquities by his great love? Why not now? Also, if we have if wandered from this commitment, if we, we've become something, we've crossed some lines again, we should not have even gotten near, then why not now? Why not take advantage of this place and this time and this moment, this opportunity to come back to the love, come back to the family, so that when everybody's going in the gate one day, we get to go in with them and we get to enjoy the family reunion. Why not now? Why not come while together we stand and sing? Well.